I want to move on to a story that uh, Helena mentioned to me this morning, which I found actually intriguing. Now, I will come back to the Donald Trump thing, by the way, because loads of people want to talk about it. Uh, but this story, I think, is really, really important. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I wasn't aware of all this, to be honest, which I'll be completely honest, that the Congo, like many African countries in the years after the Second World War, had turned against the, the European ruler, Belgium, uh, and uh, they declared independence in 1960. The new government was ill-prepared for its new role, and the UN uh, Security Council set up the UN operation in the Congo to support it. And 157 Irish men were sent out as part of a peacekeeping mission led by a tactically astute commander. Uh, They routed a force of 3,000 attackers, killing 300 of them while suffering no fatalities themselves. But it became a lot more than that. And these particular men came back to Ireland. And at the time, it was suggested that they surrendered. Now, this surrender, of course, was seen as some sort of cowardly act. And it was all hush hush by the Irish army. But it seems that wasn't the case at all. These men, of course, ran out of supplies, ran out of ammunition. Uh, they were fighting. They were outnumbered, of course, by 3,000 attackers, 157 Irish men. Um, they were then taken into custody. And it took the Irish government quite some time to get them back out and get them back to Ireland, where they didn't even get a hero's welcome. They were recognised as heroes back in 2017, but they still haven't received their medals yet. And on the line is Leo Quinlan, who's the son of Commander Pat Quinlan, who was there at the time. Uh, good afternoon to you, Leo. Uh, good afternoon, Al. OK, maybe give us a little... For those of us, including myself, who may be ignorant to the whole story, give us a little bit of a background, and I'm sure your dad has told you many times about this, but give us a little bit of background on the story and what actually happened. OK, um, well, I kind of know a lot about it myself because I was also in the Army, so I studied it. But anyway, very briefly, in 1961, a battalion went out to the Congo. It was the 2nd Battalion to go out, and uh, 25th Battalion. And a company was my father's company of that battalion. And they were there for six months, but during the six-month period of time, they were sent to a place called Jadaville in September of 1961. Uh, 155 men went there, supposedly to look after the Belgian population, the white population, I should say, keep them safe from the black population. Mm -hmm. Uh, This was a ruse. Uh, They were kind of uh, asked to go there by the Belgian government. Uh, We discovered later it was a ruse to get some UN troops into that area so they could be used as political pawns in a chess game later, which is what happened. Yeah. So they went to, they went there to protect the white population after a Swedish company and another Irish company have already uh, turned back and said we're not needed there and the Belgians and uh, sorry the the Indians and the Swedes refused to send anybody out there. So they, their the main Irish. purpose was to protect the Bel- Belgian settlers I suppose in the That's area. That's right. The Belgian yeah. settlers who were running everything, running the big mines that was that were um yeah, because this was a min- this was a mineral rich funding. town at the time. Correct, as well as Katanga, it, was, yeah. it was the breadbasket of the whole Katanga province. Okay, and uh, so they they had uh, wealth there to beat the band, and they had investment coming in from England, America, Germany, France, uh, and so on, keeping everything going. And those that inward investment was supporting the president Chombe, who uh, was the president, self-styled president of the break, breakaway Katangan province, breakaway from the Congo. Right. That's why the UN were there in the first place. But anyway, a company went out there in September. And, uh, your your and father, of course, was the, the the commandant. He was the he was the commandant. He yeah. was a forty two year old commandant at the time. And, and he, was he was in was charge a comp- of a company. He was company commander of a company with one hundred fifty five men, uh, different ranks, officers and CEOs and men. So they were in Jadaville and uh, without going through the whole process. Thing, but he, they were, he, noted, they were he would have noticed levels of hostility, I suppose, up to that point. Yeah, absolutely. He was a, a very clever South Kerry man, you know. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he could see it. Anybody, they, everybody could see it. So um, he started getting his men to dig in. A uh, important point to make is that they went out and they uh, took over villas and buildings that were rented for them by the United Nations for any UN that would go into that area. That's where they would stay. So he got, a- he got this instinct and he decided, right, let's dig in here. 1.5 metre deep trenches, stockpile water and guns and ammunition to be prepared, I suppose, in some sense. That's for, right. Yeah. Well, you're right. You're right up to the point. Guns and ammunition, they didn't have enough. When yeah. they were going out there, they didn't have enough transport, so they weren't able to bring the heavy guns. They weren't able to bring enough ammunition. They only could bring three days of food with them. And therein lay uh, a, a major problem. Because when the battle started on the morning of the 13th of uh, September, uh, Wednesday the 13th of September, 
and went on until Sunday, they very quickly ran out of everything. They ran out of food, they ran out of water. I, I, have, a, I have a list here of what they basically had, which were 60 millimeter mortars, Vickers machine guns, so uh, shoulder fired anti tank guns, Bren, yes. Bren like machine gun, which is actually something I fired when I was in the FCA. They had yes. one truck, two Jeeps, and an intermittent radio communication. So, in other words, they had very Correct. little. Yeah. You're, you're, you're very well up in your research there. Yes, absolutely. That was it. And compared to the enemy, they had 155 Irish. The enemy had, they discovered anyway that they were landed into the middle of the staging and training area for the Katanga Army where there were 5,000 enemy troops. And there was no enemy yet. You see, there's no battle. It was all mm-hmm. keeping the peace. And so they didn't expect any trouble. They shouldn't have expected any trouble. And I can al- almost uh, visualize part of the story here that it mentions where Sergeant John uh, Monaghan, he was the yes. first to see these wave of attackers coming. And I, I can visualize the story because it mentions that he had just finished shaving. He had a, sh- a towel over his shoulder. You can almost see that in a movie, can't you? Here he is having yep. a shave, towel over his shoulder. Yep. And uh, suddenly, you know, he feels that he sees this first wave of attack. And, yeah. and, and what happened then at that point then? Well, actually what happened was 7.30, 7.25 in the morning, they got a phone call from uh, Elizabethville, the battalion headquarters to say that an attack had gone in Elizabethville, which they knew nothing about. And uh, so the officer in command, uh, sorry, the officer who took the phone call ran to my father to tell him what happened. He said, sound the alarm, but before that could be alarm, the alarm could be sounded, the enemy attacked. And it was a private Harry Dell who saw them coming, and he opened up with a gust of submachine gun, which wouldn't hit anything more than 20 yards away. Mm-hmm. But that alerted John Monaghan, as you rightly said, he jumped behind a bigger machine gun and took out the first jeep that came through. The plan was the jeeps would come through with machine guns on the back and spray the Irish, who were all at mass at that time, in the morning. And then there were waves of uh, infantry hidden in the bush waiting to come in to mop up. They discovered when there were prisoners later that uh, the enemy expected the whole battle to be over in one hour. lasted for five days. And so the Irish were basically being hit by mortars and heavy machine gun fire as well. And a, and a jet bomber. Yeah, uh, who head, was probably head, dropping head, bombs on them as well. Yes, there were, and injured a few people, and five Irish were injured. Uh, the enemy had heavy mortars that had 75 millimeter howitzer. They had uh, far more weaponry to outnumber the Irish 20 to 1. Right, so... At that stage then, look, they, they had tried to obviously get help from the UN and nothing came, no help came for them. They were well outnumbered. There's nothing help they could tried. do. tried. They yeah. tried to sell help twice. And uh, Indians and Irish were coming up from 80 miles away. But they came to a bridge called the uh, river called the Lufira with a bridge across it. And the enemy had fortified that bridge and the Irish could not, uh, the relief column could not get through. And just to point out to people, by the way, with the little ammunition that they had, with the little uh, provisions that they had, uh, their vehicles were destroyed by these by these bombs that were being dropped by the jets. Correct. Um, they still managed to hold off these 3,000 attackers that outnumbered them for five days. Yes, they did. they did. I mean, that must have been a horrific time. And I'm sure your dad has spoke to you about that. I mean, you, you could imagine yes. being in a trench, you know, lacking in water, provisions, food, ammunition, and trying to hold off the fear of God must have been and in these, these worse, individuals. Worse than that, worse than that. Uh, the way you've described it was bad, but it's actually worse because the trenches were in back gardens of houses. The artillery coming in, the heavy mortars coming in, particularly on day two, Thursday, broke all the sewage pipes. Sewage was leaking into the trenches. On the fourth or fifth day, they were beginning to get ill. Uh, dehydration, dysentery, etc. So all that was staying on them, a lack of sleep. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, what saved them, a few things saved them. One, the small mortars we had, the Irish had, and the machine guns kept the enemy as far out as possible, even though they did get in within 20 yards of time. And they, well, they did manage to kill 300 of them as well. 300 yeah. plus 750 wounded. Mm-hmm. And therein, the other problems for the morale of the Irish, because as I've read and heard from people, you know, during the night you had a lot of wounded lying in the bush within 20, 40 yards of the Irish crying for help and all that. And, and many, and many nice of those soldiers, to... by the way, who survived all this have said that your father is the reason that they survived. Uh, well, yes. Because he took control of the situation. He, yes, well, he was a good tactician, obviously. He knew what he was doing. He placed the trenches. The trenches were very cleverly dug, very well camouflaged, not like in the film. Very well camouflaged. This is the and film that actually, it. the film was on Netflix. It's called The Siege of uh, Jadaville. Siege of Jadaville, yep, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, and the film was pretty accurate, but it was only showed a two-day battle. The battle went on for five days. Mm-hmm. And um, day and night, they hardly ever slept. 
earlier was slept. And uh, it I've, was wa- I've watched some of the. I, I haven't actually seen this Netflix movie, but I'm going to make it my business to watch it now. But I've watched some of the, the footage, and particularly recently, they've put color into it and made them look made it look really well. The footage of, of World War Two and the men in the trenches. Yeah. And my God, to be in that situation, to survive a situation like that, if you don't lose your calm and lose your nerves, I mean, it must be physically harrowing to be in a situation like that. Yes, uh, so I've heard, and um, my father was telling me about it, and other veterans have told me about it. Not very nice, no. but um, they knew what they were doing. They were very well trained, and they were very young. This is the amazing thing. Two of the guys, uh, the soldiers, were 15 years old. Mm. The mothers collected the children's allowance in the post office in that loan on the Friday morning while they were fighting in Jadaville. See, it was, a, it was a, for people who don't understand that times were different. I'm mean, sure I joined the FCA when I was 16. For God's sake, we were you were meant to be older, but I mean times yeah. are very different because people, young men, I suppose, just left school at 15 years of age and went into the army, and they wanted a job, mm-hmm. and they told lies about their age. They yeah, said, yes, that's I'm what 18, I did, and they were taken in. So did I in the FCA. Yeah. I joined the FCA at 15. Yeah, you know what age you 17 or sort of right? Yeah, absolutely. Here. Yeah, and uh, you know so these guys. Were two of them were fifteen. Twelve of them, by my reckoning and my research, were twelve or sixteen years old. Mm-hmm. Uh, the young man, Matt Quinlan, mentioned no relation to me. Mentioned last night by his sister Bernadette was sixteen years old in the Battle of Jadaville, and he commanded a mortar crew and did fantastic work with it. Consequently, he was recommended for a medal for a, a distinguished service medal and for promotion to corporal. He didn't get either. And as his sister described, he lived a very unhappy life, as did many others. And he took his own life years later in Australia. Oh, my. Uh, but but what, 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 what I wanted to talk to you about was, them. I mean, at the time, they had no choice, obviously, it was to surrender to the enemy in the end, because they were outnumbered. They were going to be killed. Um, they had no supplies. Nobody was coming to help them. And, you know, the surrender of the company was seen, I suppose, at the time of some sort of national embarrassment, which, was, which basically overshadows the men's courage and their competence. Well, that's not quite the way it happened. Um, the enemy asked for the ceasefire, not the Irish. On the, on the Friday night and into Saturday, the enemy requested ceasefire. They were losing too many, too many casualties. And I have all this. This is all well mm-hmm. documented. And uh, the ceasefire was in negotiation. But when no further help came, and the uh, ceasefire was agreed, written between uh, my father and Minister Manongo, who was the, like the Minister for Justice, of Katanga, they agreed a ceasefire where the Irish would keep their weapons, move into the hotel, the battle was over, diplomatic efforts would be made to keep everything calm and so on. But when no further help came, then the enemy, as we call them, they broke the ceasefire agreement and they became prisoners. When they And then after Jadaville, they went back into action. When they, became, they were prisoners of war for six weeks and there was an exchange of prisoners and then they went immediately back into action and they carried out some of the biggest Actions like the just demolition of uh, the destruction, I should say, of Soko Petrol. I won't go into what all that is about, but that mm. was another big thing in late November, early December. And they were again back in action right up until the day they all came home to Ireland. Interestingly, when they came home to Ireland, there were civic receptions in Galway, Longford, Mullingar, and Athlone. Uh, mayors of the city, of the towns, as the heads of everything came out to meet them, and uh, they were applauded and lauded and uh, in the newspapers and letters from TDs, letters from America, praising them. And then it died a death. And, you know, it's simply a fact and why, that... Why, uh, and why do you think that was? Why do you think that happened? It's fairly obvious. It's fairly obvious. The United Nations made a mess of the Congo. The United Nations were supposed to be out there to keep the peace. Uh, and the United Nations were the ones who attacked first. Mm. So this, uh, it should have, essentially, they, it should have never happened. Correct. It yeah. never happened. So without going into the political thing or the personalities involved or whatever, just that it was a UN embarrassment. Mm. So don't talk about it, bury everything. And consequently, a company, as part of all that, were forgotten about. Uh, the result was that uh, a lot of fellows, uh, because they weren't looked after, post-traumatic stress was a thing unheard of in those days. and. They, they, in other words, they weren't treated as, you know, the men, they were, the, they were the heroes that they, that they were. Yeah, they, were, they weren't recognized. They weren't recognized. So and we, you know, so those of us that have looked at all of this type of thing will say, well, supposing some of these young men had received the recognition they deserved years ago, if they had received the medal awards that they were recommended for, 33 of them, 
uh, might they have lived different happier lives? I think they lives? would have. I think and, absolutely Yes, they well, would. I think so too. And so this is uh, the kernel to everything. And this is what Bernadette Quinlan, the point she was making about her you know, her older mm-hmm. brother, the eldest in the family. Your, your dad now, Pat, he, he passed away in 1997. He was aged 78 years of age. What was... I mean, what sort of life did he have after that? I mean, I mean, you, you may not remember. Well, he too made, much, he, yeah, he made full colonel in the army. Mm. Uh, so at that time, he would have been in the top echelon of the army. Uh, when he retired, he was a soldier to the very end. He was as enthusiastic the day he retired as he was the day he joined. Uh, he he was a, a pure soldier, basically. He was a good one. He had a good brain. He how did that affect him? How did that affect him? I mean, was he having nightmares after something like that? Surely that would play havoc with your life and with your mental health. I'm sure. I never felt that from my father. He was mm. a very strong man. I think there was a bit of uh, disappointment uh, in his makeup as a result of what happened. And uh, he was uh, very proud of his men. He, for years afterwards, he was trying to help them uh, when they had difficulties. Uh, he, like Captain Liam Donnelly, and it was just mentioned to me by Captain Donnelly's uh, daughter just uh, 20 minutes ago, he also uh, suffered for years of worry about the men, those that uh, were suffering from post-traumatic stress, those that took to drink, those that had unhappy lives, those that had broken marriages, mm-hmm. and those that died in ill health. Every one of those affected my father and affected uh, Captain Donnelly, for example. So and That it- was the legacy of Jadavu. In 2017, they were recognised as heroes eventually. Mm-hmm. Um, but the problem is, they still haven't received these medals. And a lot of these men, most of these men, are all very elderly men now at this stage, if not, if they haven't passed away already. No, and, there eight, the 33 were nominated for medals, eight of them are still alive. Mm. And it's, it's worth mentioning that uh, 33 were recommended for Distinguished Service Medals, but five of those were also recommended for the Military Medal for Gallantry, which is equivalent to the Victoria Cross. Now, that takes uh, some act of bravery to be recommended for that. And but just listening to the story, and I know, I know I'm looking at the text coming in here, the message coming in, by the way, listening to the story, and people are intrigued by the story, because many people, if they hadn't maybe seen the movie as well on Netflix, didn't know the story. But, you know, it hasn't been recognized enough that these men, these, you know, Irish men were there at a peacekeeping mission, ended up in what was essentially a war, uh, and, you know, and stood their ground essentially, you know, and, yeah, and they, protected they, people. And they were very, very good. They were extremely good. My father, for years afterwards, revered those men for what they went through and the loyalty and the courage that they showed. And absolute uh, wonderful men, he said. And, uh, and what, what has been the reaction from the state when you're, I, I'm assuming what you, you as his son is saying, well, you know, we want these medals. Where are these medals? We've been, they've okay, been recognised well, as heroes. That, that, Where's the medals? That's, that's work in progress. And uh, the Why is it taking are, so long, Leo? Well, it was buried for years. It was buried for many, many years. And uh, even I, when I was growing up and in the army, and I, I spent 25 years in the army as a commandant, I was on ranger courses with some of the men from Jadaville, and I never knew they were in Jadaville mm-hmm. because they didn't talk about it. And it, as uh, people have said, it wasn't out of shame, it was out of hurt. They just didn't talk about it. Uh, but they were amazing men. And, you know, now, later when I realized that these people that I knew and worked with had been in Jadaville, and this explained a lot about them, how good they were, the strength of character they had, and the kind of soldiers they really were. They were excellent. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody just texted and said, you're amazing, you're amazing at telling the story. But if people want to see the movie, by the way, it is called The Caesar of Jadaville. Yeah. It's, it's on Netflix. And well, at the moment, it. about 80 million people have seen that film on Netflix, except maybe you and a few others. <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't actually. I, I, I'm now going to watch it, Leo, because I, I know, I know the, number, the story. It, I know. It's been, a number, it's been in the top 10 on Netflix for the last three years. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, it's interesting that the story of Jadaville is a case history in the German army for about 27 years in the Australian Army for about 13 years, it's in the British Army, it's in various other armies now. Somebody by the way from Cork is texting, he says, can you ask that man about the battle at the bridge? My father often spoke about it. Uh, yeah. It comes in from Christian Cork. What, what was the battle at the bridge? The bridge was where, and it's, well, it's good that that man from Cork answered this because I'd like to make the point. Uh, the uh, uh, relief column was sent from Elizabethville 80 miles away to try to get through to Jadaville to get the, bring them to safety. They came to a bridge called the Lufira Bridge over the Lufira River about 18 miles from Jadaville. Twice they tried to get across it and could not. Almost impossible to get across such a bridge. You know, with uh, 10 men could hold off 100 men or 200 men. But... These men that came were brave, Indians and Irish, and nine Indians lost their lives trying to get up to the bridge and get back on two occasions. So 
they were really brave people that just weren't able to get across the bridge. And because they couldn't get across the bridge, the people in Jadaville had no choice but to try to survive on their own. And as you said, running out of food and ammunition, etc., water, mm-hmm. everything else. With no backup. The, yeah. With no backup, uh, even though they tried, no backup. Uh, it was inevitable that um, they would, uh, let's say, end up as captives or dead. And as one veteran made a point to me, he said, they didn't need to attack us anymore. He said, one more night, and they'd have walked in and we'd all have been comatose in the trenches. Uh, so that was that was reality. That was the reality, you know. All right. Well, what can somebody just text in and says somebody says, "Is there anything we can do as citizens to assist Leo in making sure these men are recognised? Is there anything that people can do? Because obviously you're waiting patiently for these medals. Yes. Well, look, uh, on that in that regard, uh, the medals. Um, it'd be lovely if these eight men were awarded the medals uh, while they're still alive, and the others posthumously. Mm. And it just means, please tell people, tell the appropriate people, look, can you do the right thing now? I know that the Army Chief of Staff is looking at it very carefully. He's supportive. I know that many, many uh, people in government are supportive. It just needs to, and it's it's there to be done, and it's easy to be done, despite what some people might say, but it is actually easy to be done. It just needs two sentences to be written by the Minister for Defence, and then the job is done. And th- there is goodwill coming our way now, and I think that it should be looked at, uh, look, this can be a win-win for everybody. A win for the government, a win for the Department of Defence, a win for the Army, and most certainly a win for the veterans and their families. And that's what we're hoping for. Well, listen, it was wonderful to talk to you, and the texts that I could, I could read out, so many texts coming in, so many positive texts, by the way, of people saying wonderful things in relation to you and your father and the way you speak about him and the way you speak of the story and, and the way you tell the story, by the way, I think it gives people a really good picture of what happened at that particular time. And I wish you well, uh, Leo, and I'm sure your father will be very proud of you listening to you talk, <laughs> talking about him. On well, the he's always my hero anyway. Oh, Leo, listen, okay, thank, thank you very thank much you indeed, very much. Uh, Leo Quinlan. Thank care. you.